Today's scripture reading comes from John chapter 14, uh, verses 24 to 31. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. This is the word of God. We started John 14 with these comforting words from the Lord Jesus. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus knew that his disciples would have a lot of reason to be troubled in the coming days. This is the night of his coming betrayal before he leads them out to Gethsemane and is betrayed is the eve of his trial and then his death and being buried in the tomb. He knew that his disciples would flee, that they would run for their lives expecting to be arrested themselves. And so he speaks these words of comfort and promise to them. And as we see in our passage for today, he speaks his peace to them. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. We've seen from earlier in the chapter that following Jesus is about knowing God. It's about knowing his character. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so we know that God is gracious to provide Jesus as our way of salvation. God is the truth teller, the one that we can trust to keep his promises. And God is the giver of life, overflowing with generosity and love for us. The more that we know God's character, the more we will come to trust him. And that trust will grow into love for him. And Jesus said, if you love me, You'll keep my commands. In the middle of this chapter, we see the central provision that Jesus had for his disciples is the person of the Holy Spirit. I'll ask the Father. He'll give you another helper to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth who dwells with you and will be in you. Arguably, the main theme of John 14 to 17 is the Holy Spirit. As Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure and the transition of their whole ministry from walking with him, from following him, from having the Son of God with them every day, to now being dependent on the Holy Spirit, the helper. In fact, Jesus, he didn't send out the disciples and just say, now go. Go make disciples. Go tell the world. Remember, he said, wait. Stay in Jerusalem until you've been clothed with power from on high. Wait. You won't be successful at this mission of preaching the gospel and making disciples until you are filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he will empower you to go. The helper, whom the Holy Spirit, the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. This is how to have peace, is to walk in a living relationship with the Holy Spirit. Anyone need peace today? You don't have to raise your hand, but what a word from the Lord that he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He is the Good Shepherd. The Holy Spirit is the Comforter, the Helper who comes alongside, who guides and empowers us, who teaches us all things and leads us into the fulfillment of the the will of God. This is how we can keep our hearts from being troubled and keep from walking in fear and worry. We'll see three keys to experiencing resilient peace. 
whatever challenges you are facing, you can put yourself in the disciples' shoes and imagine the uncertainty, the fear, the danger that they faced, and hear these words from Jesus in order to experience his peace. Three keys to walking in peace. First of all, study God's word to know God's will. Back in verse 24, Jesus said, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And this word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. You'll see this Trinitarian relationship over and over again, the Father and the Son and their interactions with one another. But Jesus said that the sign of love for him was obedience to his commands. And one who does not love Jesus does not keep his words. Jesus gave his followers two priceless gifts, his word and his spirit. Here he's promising the spirit, but his, his tenses are a little confusing in this passage, aren't they? That the spirit, that in some ways, the spirit's already present with them, and in some ways, future and scholars debate at what point the apostles were filled with the spirit. Um, something certainly shifted gears at Pentecost, but um, Jesus, after the resurrection, speaks peace to them and breathes on them, and um, so there's debate over the exact timing that they were filled with the Spirit. But these are the great gifts that Jesus gave to them and to us, the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And you can't miss these two things in this passage because Jesus is saying, what the Holy Spirit's going to do is remind you of my Word. Now, we've had over a hundred years of division and debate in the global church over the Word and the Spirit. If you're not familiar with this, this discussion, it's very contentious and can be very confusing. But these two things should never have been separated. The Word of God and the Spirit of God are never at odds with each other. They are always in perfect harmony. The Holy Spirit's job is to lead us into a full understanding of the truth of God's Word. The Holy Spirit works through the Word of God, and we can only understand the Word of God as the Holy Spirit helps us to understand His Word. It should never be separated. It should never be placed at odds with one another. But I bet if I ask the question today, and again, don't raise your hand, how many of you are Pentecostal? Many in this room would be reluctant to say, I am Pentecostal because of what that word has come to mean in our culture. But everyone who follows Jesus and obeys his word better be Pentecostal in the sense of being dependent on the Holy Spirit who was poured out at Pentecost. The true Pentecost of the church happened around 30 A.D., not 1906, in Los Angeles. That was the beginning of the charismatic Pentecostal movement was a set of revivals that took place in 1906. But that's not when the Holy Spirit was first poured out. That was, in my estimation, a renewal that needed to take place to bring life back to the church, like all revivals have been. And like many revivals and signs of the Holy Spirit's activity, there can certainly be confusion that creeps in and some abuses of these things. But I hope we would all say we are Pentecostal in the sense of loving the Holy Spirit, depending on the Holy Spirit, walking with the Holy Spirit, and celebrating the gift that was given at Pentecost. Similarly, if I asked how many of us are charismatic, we again might be reluctant to raise our hands on that, but charis is the Greek word for grace, and I don't think any of us want to not have access to grace. Charismata are the gifts of grace, and we certainly want and depend on the spiritual gifts that are the gifts of God's grace to us. We need to remember that our Trinity is not Father, Son, and Holy Scriptures, but Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What matters is having a living relationship with the Holy Spirit. And this whole section of John 14 to 17 should help us understand and walk in that reality. The truth is that the, the Bible gives us clear instructions for understanding the gifts of the Spirit and walking with the Spirit. I don't mind if someone wants to practice the gift of tongues and speaking in a, a, a spiritual language of some kind, if it is interpreted 
as is clearly explained in the New Testament for the use of the gift of tongues. Tongues must be interpreted if given in a public setting. There are clear instructions for that. Speaking in a spiritual language in a public setting, es como hablando en otro idioma que muchas personas en el cuarto no pueden entender, entonces no ayuda mucho. It's just not helpful, right? If someone starts speaking in a language, you, that was Spanish. May not have been great Spanish, but that's what it was an attempt. It's just not helpful to speak in a language that most people can't understand unless it's translated so that then people can understand. And Paul gives very clear guidelines on that. Similarly, if someone wants to practice in discerning words of prophecy to speak encouragement and exhortation, I'm not opposed to that practice, but any word that God gives you for someone must be compatible with the word because we don't speak with any authority of our own apart from the revealed word of God in Scripture. And the Holy Spirit will never lead you into someone or something or encourage you to lead someone else into something that opposes God's word. So gifts of the Spirit must always be applied in the context that God has given us and the instructions that we have from Him. Similarly, if someone wants to call the elders together that we can pray for you for a healing of a specific illness or challenge, we are happy to do that and available. If you just contact us, we will schedule a time that we can meet and pray with you. But I'll warn you, our process comes directly from James chapter 5. And what James describes as the way of calling the elders together to pray involves that person coming confessing their sins verbally to the elders who are gathered. So we are open to that. We will pray for you. And it's not saying that all illness and challenges directly tied to sin, but some can be. And that is part of our process when we meet with someone and pray with them. And even if the illness wasn't caused by sin, sometimes we can begin to sin in our response to pain and ongoing challenge. So the point is, we follow God's word in the application of all of these things. And if we want to experience peace, we need to study God's word in order to know his will on all of these things. You, you, you won't be in church very long before you realize like, oh, there's different kinds of churches. And they practice these things in different ways. You, you will experience confusion and you'll feel pulled in different directions if you don't become a student of God's word and understand the proper way to apply some of these things. The way Jesus summarizes it is, if you, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. The way you'll be able to find other people who love me is you'll see that they obey my commands. And guys, my main command is to love one another. We'll get to John 17 when he says, let's just remember, you are all one. We're one body. We're one family. As, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one in the Godhead, so is the body of Christ. We are united. And so division within the church grieves the heart of God. Unity is his desire for all of us within the church. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Do you know Jesus? Do you love his words? Do you enjoy studying scripture to dig into the teachings of Jesus? Because we, here's our, the summary for today. The way to experience peace is to know God's will and do it. Just knowing God's will is not enough. You have to actually walk in it, but you cannot walk in the will of God until you know it. So that's why the first key to experiencing peace is to be a student of God's word, to study scripture. And that's why I've given you these examples that are out there as things that confuse and divide the body of Christ, but they need not, they should not, because the spirit of God should never be separated from the word of God. They are not at odds with each other. Notice Jesus says, the word that you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Jesus is always modeling that living relationship of submission to his Father and calling us to live in that same kind of submission to him and to his words. It's significant he says it here in a negative way. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. What he's saying is, if you don't obey my commands, 
you are not a follower of mine. It reminds us of what he says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Cast out demons in your name? Do many mighty works in your name? I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. These are miracle workers. These are people involved in spiritual warfare, casting out demons in the name of Jesus. They call Jesus Lord, but they don't actually know him. Their motives are not right for even the way they're trying to follow the pattern of the Lord Jesus. Now, a passage like this should give us a little twinge of not peace, right? All of us are called in Philippians to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, to reflect on whether we truly do belong to the Lord Jesus. I'll tell you this, the sign that you know Jesus and that you love him is that you love his word. You study his word and your desire is to walk in obedience to his word. The only way to know God's will and to walk in it is to become a student of Scripture in order to study what does God want in general. When you study the life and teachings of Jesus and you study the New Testament, you will see what Jesus likes and he affirms and he commends and you will see what he does not like. You know one of the main things Jesus does not like is people who know a lot of Scripture but do not apply it. Do not live a life of love. There's a danger in knowing too much that we don't actually live out and obey. You get that from the New Testament. What amazes Jesus? What grieves him? What prompts him to yell? What miracles does he, does he perform and when? You study the life of Jesus and you see the general will of God. Same thing with the Old Testament. What made God angry? Helping to coach a soccer team at the school that Micah, Micah goes to, and uh, there's, we do this, you know, start of the year orientation, telling the kids the rules, how long their hair can be, all these specific rules that, uh, that they, have to, they have to follow. But one of the principles is don't complain. And if it had been my meeting, I would, have, I would have jumped in with this. But do you remember the Old Testament story, what happened when the Israelites complained? I mean, a number of, there's a number of times it happened. <laughs> this is a great one for like sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And you're like, you want to complain? The ground opened up and swallowed them, you know? I mean, you get this. So you see, you read the Old Testament, and you get a feel for the things that, like, the heroes of the, of the Bible, when David stands up and defies this uncircumcised Philistine who is impugning the character and power of God, you see this, God's mighty deliverance. You see Elijah on, the, on Mount Carmel, and he's calling out the prophets of Baal. And then, but then you see the things that grieve the heart of God. As we study this book, we come to know the heart and the character of our God. We know his general will. But then as we apply it, we, we grow into his specific will for us. Here's how Paul summarizes it in Romans 12. Don't be conformed to this world that's trying to press us into its mold, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. This is our, our calling. If we want to experience peace, we have to study God's word in order to know his will and grow more and more, be transformed more and more into his image through the renewal of our minds with the study of God's word. Second key, the word going along directly with the spirit. Listen to God's spirit in order to keep in step with God's will. It's not enough to just know God's will generally. We have to actually walk in it. These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Jesus saying, it's been three years. I've been walking with you. You've had me literally with you. You can ask me any question. You've seen my example. You've been sent out uh, by me on, on missions, and I've said all these things, all these teachings while I'm with you. But now, I'm going to leave in the Holy Spirit is going to come. And remember, he said, it's better, if you, if you knew what I was talking about, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I, and the Holy Spirit will then come, and you will do even greater things than I have done. We wrestled with that last week in the middle of John 14. 
Why is it better? The disciples must have wrestled with that. Lord Jesus, what could be better than having the Son of God walk directly with us? And Jesus probably would have pointed to his, his body and just been like, I'm stuck in this thing. You know, it just occurred to me as I was reflecting on that this, this week, that Jesus had to sleep. Now, is it possible that his divine side couldn't sleep and stayed in communion with the Father? I suppose that's possible, but I think our understanding of the incarnation is for eight, seven, eight, nine hours a day, the Son of God was blissfully unconscious. Has that ever occurred to you? That as part of his incarnation, not only, obviously, with the human body, the Son of God was in one place at a time. He couldn't be everywhere. He was, in, he was limited to one place. His knowledge was limited to what his human eyes could take in. You know, you think the limits that were taken away when Jesus ascended to the Father and is, you know, now he doesn't have to sleep anymore. He can see everything. He can, he can know everything. He can intervene. You know, in a, he's like, you don't want me in this human body anymore. I am so limited here. He got weak he got sick. He had days when he just would have laid in bed in illness. The Son of God. It's like, it's better for you, and it's like, it's better for me. I'm not even stuck in this container in an unglorified state. And he's like, and the Holy Spirit is going to be able to be with all of you at all times. You're not going to be able to stay in one small group forever. Jesus said, you have to multiply. The Holy Spirit will Look at what he'll do. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said. This verse tells us how the New Testament got written. I mean, the chosen shows us Matthew and John. It's kind of fun that they have their little notebooks and stuff, and they're, and they're taking notes. Maybe. Maybe they, maybe they did. Um, but I think this verse shows us whatever they did write down, whatever they had um, from other interviews and stuff, it's the Holy Spirit who made sure that they remembered in correct detail the things that Jesus did and got them all documented in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He will teach you all things. But this applies to us as well. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Everything that you need to know in that moment, he will teach you. Not necessarily much beforehand, but the way he will teach you is by reminding you of the words of Jesus bringing you back to, I remember Jesus said that. I remember that he did that. We use a little tool in our Bible studies and discipleship groups called an SOS. There's a modified version of this called SOAPS, same idea. But as you read the Bible, we encourage you to ask these three questions. Lord, what do you want to say to me? This, this book is a living book. The Holy Spirit will speak to us every time we open it, if we ask him to. What do you want to say to me? It's why we call it the Word of God. It's God's continued speech to us. So you open the Bible, Lord, what do you want to say to me today? And moving from that into how would you have me obey? Going back again to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, don't hear my words and do nothing with them. That's like a fool who built his house on the beach with no foundation. They hadn't even heard of hurricanes probably. We want to be like the wise man who built his house on the rock, who hears the teachings of Jesus and does them. The general will of God is that as we learn from his word, we obey it. And part of that obedience is to share what we're learning. So coming to scripture with these questions is a helpful reminder for us to not only know God's will, but to do it. To live in step with the Holy Spirit's guidance for us. Now, Many of us who have been in church a long time, more than a couple of years, especially if you're up to more than a couple of decades, the odds are that a tool like this feels new to you, as it does to me. That it's like, that's, that's a new, that's a new, you're meddling there, Pastor, trying to get us to actually obey, trying to get us to actually share what we're learning. Where is this coming from? A lot of us have been raised in this culture of small groups and Bible studies and Sunday school where the mantra is, just keep learning, just keep learning, just keep learning. I'm trying to be Dory. It's a bad musical version of it. You can, you can have that approach 
to discipleship and your walk with the Lord and just keep learning every day that you read the Bible, every small group, every Bible study. Why are you joining this Bible study? Ladies, why are you going to join this Wednesday night Bible? Just to keep learning. I just want to learn. I just want to learn more. You will. You'll learn. Why would you join a small group? I want to learn. I want, is that all? Many of us have been trained in this. We've been raised up in the point of joining a small group is to learn and to be encouraged. What about to obey? What about to have accountability? What about to grow as an actual disciple of the Lord Jesus? Some of these things are feeling like new applications in the church, and we need tools like this to help us actually learn a different way of living. Because peace comes from knowing God's will and doing it. And a tool like the SOS helps us with that. We need to learn to know the Spirit's voice and to walk in step with His leading for us. The New Testament gives us three principles for our relationship with the Spirit. First, we're called in Ephesians to be filled with the Spirit. It doesn't say fill yourself with the Spirit. It says be filled. Only God can fill you with his spirit, but that's the command is in chapter 3 of Ephesians, to so experience the love of Christ, to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled. The way to, to have a, a full and living relationship with the Holy Spirit is to, as you study scripture, to see the sacrifice of Jesus everywhere that you read. And even in the Old Testament, you'll see there's something in that passage that's pointing ahead to the need for a Savior or the promise of a Savior or the blood that is required to cover our sin. And the more we appreciate the love of God for us, the more we'll experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit. But it's not about, the, a lot of times we hear that, and again, you're like, you're getting all Pentecostal on us there since you're sabbatical there, Pastor Darren. <laughs> you know, keep your shorts on, we're good. Just being filled with the Spirit is not about the emotional experience of it necessarily. There may be some emotions that come with it. The point of being filled, go back to Ephesians 3, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It's about knowing God, being close to Him, and becoming more like Him. That's the sign that you're filled with the Spirit, is that the fruit of the Spirit is growing in you. Love, joy, peace, patience. You're becoming more and more loving. That's the problem. More knowledge does not always lead to more love. In fact, more knowledge often leads to more judgment. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So if what we're, what, if what we're accomplishing through the just keep learning approach to Bible study in groups is gaining more knowledge without more love applied, we're actually getting further from God's will, not closer to it. Walking with the Spirit is keeping in step with his specific leading for you. The Bible will show you God's general will, what he likes and doesn't like. The Holy Spirit is the one who has to show you his specific will for you right now, this very minute. And the, the thing about the Holy Spirit is that he is very, very good at that job. He's very good at it. He doesn't ever struggle to know, I wonder what's on your mind right now. I wonder what's really in your heart. I wonder what your motive was for that. He knows exactly. He discerns it perfectly. And he, and he just so gently, doesn't, sometimes it's kind of firm, but he'll just gently put his finger on that area. You know exactly what it is. And he'll be like, no, 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 no. Not that. This is the way of love. This is the path to follow. Peace is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, joy. Peace is in the top three. How do we experience peace in the midst of challenge and struggle? Only through the Holy Spirit producing that fruit in us. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I don't give as the world gives. How does the world give? The world doesn't give, it trades. The world says, I will give you this if you pay me that. I will give you this in exchange for that. And Jesus says, I give in a way that the world doesn't, because I give freely and generously without expectation of return. This is the peace that Jesus offers as we listen to his spirit and walk in obedience. One more key to experiencing this kind of peace is to trust in God's promises to endure opposition to his will, which is certainly coming. 
saw in the news this weekend that Iran may be very close to having nuclear capability. It's no surprise that there has been significant ongoing conflict between Ukraine and Russia that has now escalated in a Ukrainian counterattack. I'm sure you're aware that the conflict in Israel is not yet resolved. Our world is tremendously turbulent, and we've got these big oceans on our side, so we feel insulated and relatively protected from those things, but not necessarily for much longer. Opposition to God's will is coming. It should never surprise us that the Jews in particular are targeted in the global conversation. The disciples were about to face their biggest test as Jesus was arrested, tried, and crucified. In the midst of that, he says, let not, he comes back to what he started the chapter with, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you'd rejoice because I'm going to the Father. And he reminds him of the promises he's already given him just in this chapter. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am the way to the Father. I am the truth. I am the life. Just hold on to me. And the way you'll hold on to me is this Holy Spirit who will soon come upon you. I've told you these things before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. They didn't understand. Three times Jesus said, I'm, the Son of Man is going to be arrested, going to be tried, he's going to suffer, he's going to die, but he will rise. Again, they didn't understand what that meant until the resurrection, until the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit taught them all things and helped them understand all these sayings of Jesus that had been confusing, but suddenly they began to understand. It was all part of the plan so that he could be with all of his followers in the person of the Holy Spirit. So here's our summary. How do we experience peace? It begins by studying the Word of God, the teachings of Jesus, so we can know God's will in general. The more we know his character and his will and his desires, the more then we can listen to his Spirit guiding us and keep in step with the specific will of God for us in this season of life, in this moment of life, and God gives us his great and precious promises that we can hold on to, that he can sustain us through all the different ups and downs and challenges of life. I've asked the ushers and the elders to distribute a handout now, so they're going to get working on that. Um, and soon you'll all have one of these in your hands. It's, a, it's called the Spiritual Life Worksheet. Um, about a year ago, we started a process as a leadership team to evaluate our systems as a church, our leadership and spiritual systems, our discipleship and evangelism, the way we do things. Um, and the first project in, in that evaluation was our spiritual life, just knowing that prayer and worship and faith is what drives everything else in a church. So if the, if the heart of the church is not healthy and well, the spiritual life that drives everything, then nothing else is good. You can talk all you want about outreach and strategy and city reaching and discipleship, but if the, if the heart isn't there to pump the blood to the body, the spiritual life has to be the driving force. So that was the first project. We had a, a committee that met for several months to wrestle through passages. Honestly, the reason we're doing John 14 through 17 right now is because of that process, because John 15, 5, I'm the vine, you're the branches, became so prominent in those conversations that we saw this is the key to everything else we do as a church is to learn to abide, to learn to walk with the Holy Spirit. Do we get to the front row here? I think we need these guys up here. Can't ne neglect the front row. So the result of that process was this, this spiritual life worksheet that you've got in your hands. And you can see there's just four questions Trust me, the first draft that I wrote was much more complicated, so you can thank that team for editing the Darren. It's four questions that are built around the baseball diamond. You can see that on there. How are you trusting God right now? The Christian life is, is a constant journey of faith. We're always trusting God for something. The question is, what's challenging your faith right now? What's troubling you right now that is causing you to need to trust God? In him. How are you worshiping Jesus right now? What, are, what is your spiritual life like? What's feeding that relationship? What might be resisting and holding back that relationship of worship and delight and devotion? How are you walking with the Spirit right now? 
What's helping you to live in obedience, to hear the Spirit's voice and to walk with Him? And how are you working with God right now? You remember, that's our, our mission is to join God in His work. And His work is transformational. He's transforming individuals, and in that process, whole communities are being transformed. And our calling is to join in that work. In about a month, in about a month, we will stand as a church family and recite these four commitments. But we wanted it to mean so we could say it now. We would all generally mean this if we stood instead right now. We're gonna we'll trust Jesus completely, we'll worship him passionately. We, we could say these words right now. But your assignment is to take that little piece of paper, to pray through it on your own, and to discern from the Holy Spirit what are his desires for you in this particular season of your life. You will find this exercise is greatly multiplied in its value for you if you then meet with one or two other Christians to see how the Lord's leading them and to share how he's leading you. I've done this a few times with a few different people, and each time I've sat down to talk with someone about their commitments, I come away so inspired by how the Spirit is speaking to someone else that half the time I just steal their idea which is totally fair. It's part of the beauty of community. Small groups are going to be wrestling with this document. Our hope is that this is not just a pro forma exercise of a handout that happened one Sunday and we talked about it for a few weeks, but that it becomes part of the culture of Oakwood to every three or four months, encourage everyone to say, what are my, you'll see on the back there, it uses this phrase, rule of life. What is my rule of life right now? What are the, the set of habits and practices that actually work with my schedule that help me to hear the voice of Jesus and walk with him? You have a rule of life. You, don't, you probably don't call it that. You probably call it your schedule, your calendar. Your rule of life is determined by something or some things. Oftentimes you may find your schedule is more determined by Netflix and the social media algorithms than it is by the Holy Spirit. So this is an opportunity to reflect. We're going to take a couple minutes right now to just prayerfully commit this process to the Lord. So I encourage you, you don't have to read the thing. The point right now is just to pray where you are and just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you and to make his will clear. Let's take a couple minutes and then I will close us and the team will come up and lead us in a closing song. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this encouraging passage of Scripture, for these promises you've given us to be with us always. And when we've seen you, we've seen the Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are with us, that you dwell in us, and that you have promised to lead us into all truth and to teach us all things, to bring to our remembrance the teachings of our Lord Jesus. And Lord Jesus, we do love your word and we are so amazed by your example. And our desire is to honor you, to demonstrate our love for you and our obedience to your commands. So help us, Lord. And we, we take this little piece of paper and commit it to you, asking you, Holy Spirit, to speak to us, to convict us of those parts of our lives that are, that are out of line with your will, like a bone that's out of place, and to reset that. We, we ask you to do that work for our own health and well-being and for our effectiveness and fruitfulness in the kingdom. Lord, we, we want that peace that you promised. My peace, not as the world gives, but my peace I give you. We need that peace desperately, but we know it's a fruit of the Spirit and we can't manufacture it on our own. Your Spirit has to give it to us. So help us, Lord Jesus, to know your will and do it so we can experience that peace as we walk closely with you. Guide us into what we need to trust you with right now what it looks like for us to worship you with all that we are right now, to walk with you in community with other believers, and to join the work that you're doing. We see your hand all around us in the people and places that you've put us, and we want to join in that work for your glory, for the building of your kingdom. And we commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. There's two more verses here at the end. Jesus says, I'll no longer talk much with you. The ruler of the world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, Jesus says, let us go from here. The calling is to follow our Savior on the path he has for each of us.